Welcome everyone to our webinar today. Uh, my name is Andres Abeta. I'm the director of Bootcamp GIS, which is an education platform uh, to help people get connected to instructors that are in industry and also really great speakers like our guest today, David Foster, who comes with us with an awesome background in uh, the military sector related to geospatial. He's currently SAMI chair of Geospatial Working Group, and SAMI is the Society of American Military Engineers, for anybody who's not in the military audience attending this call. But uh, those are two great backgrounds. And um, David, welcome to our call. Thank you so much for having me, Andres. So David and I know each other for about five years in and around lots of different um, geospatial venues like the Esri User Conference and SAMI itself, their, their um, national webinars. And so I, I value his advice and his perspectives because he's very entrenched in the industry and works with lots of people at a high level and thinks outside the box in the larger scheme of things, how we support geospatial decisions. So um, David, I'd like to first ask you, as we all have this circuitous and, and maybe even accidental story, how we got into the roles we have um, you know, as geospatial leaders, how'd you get exposed to these tools and ultimately become uh, somebody to lean on with your experience? Well, it really begins, uh, all engineer officers go through the basic course and that's where they first um, receive introduction to being a master of terrain. Uh, the engineers are masters of terrain. So they told us at the schoolhouse and then they gave us a few courses in, in uh, topographic engineering. So some very basic software back in the middle of the 90s, or I guess early 90s. And that's where it started. But it really didn't stick then. Um, really wasn't uh, something that was driven home. It wasn't until I actually was stationed in Germany and I was assigned um, to the 1st Engineer Brigade or the engineer brigade of the first infantry division and there was a specialist that was a topographic engineer and he grabbed me by the collar and said hey sir i need you to come see what i do and so that you can better use my capabilities in support of your mission and to this day that i guess it was about 12 months with that young gentleman totally changed the way in which uh the rest of my career went and, and realizing how important location was to everything that we did and that the now geospatial engineers were key to unlocking that power. Yeah, that's excellent. And spending time in Germany. So you've got this international perspective as well as, uh, you know, domestically what we do. Um, you know, when I think about uh, how geospatial is used in the military, Initially, I was like probably everybody else, okay, uh, map data is used in covert missions to um, be able to plan out where you're going to attack certain <laughs> key targets. But then I got a chance to be exposed to military installations as a, a trainer for, um, for Geobase at one point. And then I realized each of these installations is like a little miniature city. And so they have to manage assets like water and electrical and, and real estate as well. So that's kind of the, the standard use of GIS, even in the municipal uh, cases. But maybe you can enlighten us on where you see geospatial data uh, in unique cases informing geospatial decisions in areas that you know I'm not even thinking about. Well, it goes down to the fact that data provides a sound foundation for decision making. And in the engineering community, you build strong foundations out of concrete rebar so that then you have strong infrastructure to execute your mission. Digitally, that's built natural infrastructure geospatial data. Without that, you don't have a strong foundation for data analytics, um, data visualization, you know, shared situational awareness leading to wisdom that then helps you execute your mission better. Unique examples could be anywhere from base realignment and closure. So when the government has decided to divest of, of installations, one, the selection process and all the different categories of data and factors leading to those decisions um, 
can be brought into a GIS or into a geospatial platform to help that analysis, to help visualization, to go all the way up to, I think it was in 2005, BRAC deliberations, geospatial information was used to validate other information. And to that day, or to this day, that still occurs. Um, so that's divestment of huge installations uh, from all the services, actually. Um, environmental management, um, <laughs> the red cockaded woodpecker for those in the army who have trounced across <laughs> many bases with a rucksack on your back and and all of a sudden you get to the trees with the white bands around it and you have to avoid the red cockaded woodpecker um, because it's an endangered species that can be mapped and they can help manage you know uh, endangered species utilities management um, energy management talk about thermal envelopes of buildings and being able to take that thermal data and to be able to visualize it in conjunction with orthorectified imagery or light detecting and ranging. Um, supporting force protection, occupational environmental health, looking at noise, air, radon, uh, biological, uh, thermal uh, risk to, to the service members. And you're able to integrate all that data it may be coming off of somebody else's sensor about what type of threat it is, but it, where's the backflow preventer, right? And if it's a backflow preventer, the engineers own that data. But then when the bioenvironmental engineers want to actually test those backflow preventers for any of the things that would be a threat, you integrate that data and then that makes those decisions protecting the force, life, health, and safety. Um, those are just some small examples. Um, so you have an array of uh, locations within the military's missions that you can use geospatial. Um, I would expect that's the case. But I also liked what you said in that, um, you know, they're, you're trying to get information all the way to wisdom. That's what we at a maturing industry try to bring people to say it's just not good enough to have a tsunami of information out there. You've got to get really actionable pieces that support decisions. And I'm sure that's a challenge in the military. So with that as a challenge, how, how, um, how well do you think the officer corps knows the capabilities of GIS and this whole actionable intelligence um, methodology? Well, to be quite frank, uh, there's room for improvement. It's something that seems to be, at least I thought it was, um, inherent. To, to the military in general, they hand you a compass in basic training, they hand you a map, land navigation, that's important, right? Uh, but once you switch from you know, hard copy maps and acetates and now things are digital, it seems to be a cultural divide. And quite frankly, it's all just data. Uh, and I don't think it's just geospatial data that, that there's room for improvement with. I think data just in general, how data works, how it is integrated, how it is shared uh, to derive the best knowledge possible in a timely, effective, and efficient manner. So I believe there's definitely room for improvement. And I see that in the industry as a whole, especially for people get newly coming into the industry and getting educated with it let's say geography degrees, um, is that they're not uh, exposed or taught a lot about the business and the management of GIS, the bigger pictures. It's just really the tools and, you know, some analysis capabilities. And we have a couple classes on our um, catalog, like develop strategic plans or know how to mo uh, manage data and, and GIS departments agilely. And I have in the back of my mind, you would be a good person to... Um, give the overarching architecture and, and vision for how GIS can be, you know, deployed from a, a big picture level in the military. And that'd be a great class for, you know, certainly same audiences and others. I was just going to say um, the one thing that we don't receive, I told you that we received training in the, in the engineer officer basic course, and it was a 30 minute class on uh, Terra Explorer or not Terra Explorer. It was an old software that, um, people would scoff at clearly today, um, but it's 30 minutes. And that was my exposure. 
that was my training. Uh, that was my education. That was my foundation. Uh, was this thirty-minute use of this non-enterprise software desktop? You know, um, and so I personally have experienced the lack of education that is specific to what the, if in this case you talked about officers, what they would need to know to actually best take advantage of this geospatial capability that surrounds them that they might even be unaware of. Mm -hmm. All right. So you've talked about some good uses of GIS. And then uh, we talked about even a challenge. There's a big picture vision by, you know, some of the leaders. What are some of the other challenges that you see when you, as you wrestle with trying to implement um, enterprise level GIS for a whole organization? Uh, it goes back to understanding data, um, data quality, data completeness, data accuracy. Those are some significant challenges. There's actually a report that was just published. I want to look at the name here. Contractors lost 1.8 trillion globally in 2020 due to bad data, new report says. And they estimate that 14% of, of basically construction industry, 14% of the projects of all construction is basically the cost of bad data. That's st stunning. You think about that. And I actually did some research and looked up the military construction and military family housing appropriations that went to Congress for the Air Force in, for 2022. That equates to over $307.5 million if you were applying that 14% that came out of that study. That's significant. So, so the geospatial world has gotten so diverse. There's so many vertical industries and types of applications, even within the military. So nobody can know everything and it's always changing very quickly. How, how do you see that you can keep the, the officer group of people literate in just some of the, the management um, challenges and just how the industry is needing to be implemented um, on its own? Um, are there any resources they can kind of lean on? So one of the first places I'd start, if you're an engineer officer, is with our doctrine. Joint Publication 3-34, Joint Engineer Operations, lays the foundation for us to, to all build upon. It, geospatial engineers are one of three functions of the military engineer. There's combat, general, geospatial engineering. That publication is very clear on what engineers do with location data by leveraging geospatial engineers. First place I would start. Second place I would start would be with the people that are in your organization uh, that are the geospatial experts, whether it's the 12 Yankee uh, geospatial engineer in the Army, the 125 Delta engineer technician in the Army, or three E5s engineering in the Air Force, as an example, uh, or whatever branch you're in, find those folks and have a conversation. I think that a great place to start would be to watch maybe a video um, provided by well, it's a collaboration between Penn State University and I believe the United States Geospatial Intelligence Foundation, the Geospatial Revolution. There's a five minute trailer and I think now is five uh, 15 minute sessions. 15 minutes, take 15 minutes and, and just <laughs> watch one of those videos so that you can understand how location intelligence is changing our world. It's changed the way that you actually get to Starbucks in the morning. If you have, if you're TDY or traveling for business, where's the closest restaurant? I want to go to a Mexican restaurant. I want to go to a Vietnamese restaurant. Where's the closest one? What's the rating? Map it, right? Ways um, and other tools. It's embedded in our lives. So then just take a few minutes and see how it can actually impact your mission, whether it's industry supporting the DOD or if you're within DOD. Um, so I, I'd say that's a, a decent resource. And then if you want to get a little bit farther into the, 
more strategic thinking. Um, the State of GeoInt report from the United States Geospatial Intelligence Foundation provides an incredible resource. They do them annually, and it provides different perspectives from different experts around uh, the in defense, intelligence, and engineering communities to get insight from them, your peers. And lastly, get educated. And I think what you do, Andres, with Bootcamp GIS is a fundamental key to success for folks that haven't been provided that in the past as a part of their career development. Well, those uh, Penn State videos are very well produced. I've seen all of them. They're excellent. Esri is starting to put some out as well, and they're basically commercials for the Leading Edge GIS, and so it really is um, motivating, inspiring, and <laughs> makes you feel good, like, wow, I am part of something that's really big and growing and important. Uh, you and I are pretty typical of having some accidental discovery of GIS. For me, it was I just happened to take a class that I uh, needed some credits in college and it was a ge geography class. I said, wow, this is interesting. I'm going to change majors. Um, but um, how do you see uh, the, the typical engineer being able to um, craft a path into our industry that's not by accident and really could set themselves up for a career after the military and being a consultant like you know either one of us? I think what we just talked about, one, you know, start your own journey by being curious, right? And if you're curious, go find those, those resources around you to, to try to better understand what capabilities and what resources are at your disposal and what they are able to provide. And then to start your own, just, you know, the internet's a, a wonderful thing. <laughs> you can find tons of information uh, you, you know, do focused, you know, word searches or, and it's, it's quite simple to find resources that'll scratch your itch. And then to, to figure out, you know, should I take a few classes? And if so, Bootcamp GIS is a great uh, place to start. Well, that, that's good. I'll, I'll add on to that just from the education standpoint, since I spend quite a bit of time in, um, in ed tech. You know, there's three ways to learn something technical in the geospatial um, atmosphere. You can go get your master's degree, but it's going to take you a couple of years and be probably fairly expensive compared to um, some other channels. Uh, you can go straight to vendors who create um, good education about their software, such as Esri or Autodesk. Uh, but it's pretty specific to how the buttons and tools work within their software. Um, but a new thrust and a very popular area um, is boot camps, just like our name suggests. So you see a whole um, flourishing and um, uh, really rapidly growing set of uh, content providers that are coming from the commercial sector. And the commercial sector, you can kind of pick and choose who you think are good instructors for your uh, content. So they don't necessarily have to have a PhD behind their name, but they can be people in industry. And some of those may be on this call who say, hey, I'm pretty smart at uh, doing X, Y, and Z in geospatial for um, the Air Force. Um, I've got a topic that could be useful for a lot of other people in the Air Force or other military branches. If so, you should come and contact me because we can stand up uh, content very quickly and make that available for, for the masses worldwide. Um, so uh, take a look at that because micro-credentials are really thought of um, pretty highly now in the tech sector because you're learning from basically peers that are, have just figured out stuff just ahead of you. <laughs> and isn't that the way YouTube works? <laughs> we, we just want somebody that's figured out how to change out the, uh, the headlight in, um, in my brand of car ahead of me so I can just copy that and that's successful education um, in my opinion. Um, so with that, I want to say thank you to David to uh, joining us and um, exposing some enlightenment to our audience. And if you have any questions, you can follow up with uh, David. We'll put his um, contact information on this at the end or myself with um, other ideas for uh, pursuing your uh, continuing education. Uh, so thanks for your time today. Uh, thank you, Andres. All right. Cheers.